This podcast includes graphic depictions of true crime cases and may contain explicit language. Listener discretion is advised. Hello, everyone. You are listening to We Saw the Devil. This is Robin. And this episode is part two of our Lori Vallow audio series, where we basically break down that 20-minute audio and discuss, is she evil? Or is she just a religious zealot following the scriptures a bit too literally? Because in this audio that was released by Annie Cushing, Lori makes a wide variety of claims. And she actually utilizes the scripture to justify a lot of her behavior. So we enlisted the help of a special guest, Brittany, an active member of the LDS church, to help us break it down. We will continue on, and then there will actually be a part three, guys. Like I said in the last episode, we have Brittany on the line for quite a while. This episode will be the continuation in part two. Beyond that, guys, we have a crazy week ahead. Today is this episode. Wednesday will be part two of our Cult Order of the Solar Temple series, where we will get into the craziness, the suicide, baby killing, and all the other interesting pieces of that particular cult. And then Friday, we have a mini-sode coming for you with the Hello Kitty murder, which if you thought Junko Furuta was bad, we have a killer scheduled this week. So stay tuned for all of that. To get some quick housekeeping out of the way, you can find us on Facebook at We Saw the Devil, Twitter also at We Saw the Devil, and Instagram at We Saw the Devil Podcast. If you're enjoying the show, love the show, and want to back us, you can do so on Patreon. You can find our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash We Saw the Devil, and you're just in time to start up with December. So for as little as $3 a month, you can get postcards from around the world access to our Patreon-only back catalog, cool true crime gifts, vote on show topics, and access to a really, really cool Facebook group where we have a lot of fun and it's pretty much become a family. Check that out as well. Again, that's patreon.com forward slash we saw the devil. And you can also get there from our website, we saw the devil.com. So let's go ahead and air part two now. Let's move on to the next piece and I'm going to play that audio clip now. Okay. As you take out your time, which is the very first thing you consecrate when you raise your hand, you consecrate your time on this earth to go do that work. When you take out your time, and I'm telling you, all those people on the other side that have already lived on this earth, they know how busy we are. They know what it's like to be in mortality. And for whatever reason, they didn't take the time or they didn't have the ability to do that work for them. They are eternally grateful. I was in the ceiling room one time and I saw a sister, a spirit sister. It was one of my husband's aunts come over and she kissed me on the cheek before she disappeared through the wall. And I'll tell you, I've had people talk to me. I was in the ceiling room with my husband and they were going through names and we were stealing these daughters. And all of a sudden I hear this voice super loud, really loud. Don't forget about me. Don't forget about me. Twice. And I look around. I looked at the sealer. I looked at my husband. I'm like, anybody hear that? No? Okay. And so I remembered the name that we were doing because we were doing like 10 daughters. I remember the name. I went home. I looked it up on my family search. Sure enough two daughters and a son that were on there that I had missed because I don't even search it. I just let the angels do it. Okay. So one thing that I have not fully understood, the ceiling room, right? So Lori was sealed and we're kind of up in the air if it was Jason Mao in the ceiling room and so on Mm -hmm. and so forth. She says, I was in the ceiling room one time and I saw a sister, a spirit sister. It was one of my husband's aunts come over and she kissed me on the cheek before she disappeared through a wall. I've had people talk to me. She's saying that she's seeing everybody. Like she's seeing her husband's spirit sister. She's having angels and people come visit her and type on her computer. Okay. Just what? Please. please. Uh, Okay. (laughs) It's going to be okay. (laughs) So, so we believe that, you know, referring back to that plan of salvation and, and, you know, we had the spirit world before we came to this world uh, or the preexistence. We believe that after we die in, in this earth life right now, that we go to this like spiritual holding cell, if you will, where we just kind of like wait 
until the second coming when Jesus comes again. Okay, so you die and then you go to like the holding cell. Okay, yeah, but it, it's it's called the spirit world. But I we can call it the holding cell because that's what I just called it just now. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, it paints a really but good it is. like picture. Yeah. yeah, unlike you know the Baptist Church, the Methodist Church, like more Christian denominations. Yes. You're not immediately judged and, like, they send you up the elevator or down. (laughs) Right. Oh, gosh. I mean, like, if there is a complicated afterlife award that goes to any religion, I would say that Mormons throw their hat in the ring ten times over. We have a very complicated system in general. Like, I mean, this is super watered down what I'm telling you, but basically after this holding during this holding cell process while we wait for the second coming and like all this stuff to happen stuff still has to go down in there like i mean you think about everyone who's ever died statistically speaking they've never heard of mormons i mean yeah. in the grand scheme of everything like statistically speaking there's a lot of missionary work that has to happen in that holding cell and so part of our job in this world as active members of in the church is to do the temple work for those people in that holding cell. And so this family history work and like all that stuff is for us to do their work so that when in that holding cell, I picture a secretary coming up to me being like, OK, sign here if you accept or sign here if you don't. <laughs> and it's like they can either check the box if I want to be Mormon or I don't. So when this happens, so she's talking about how her husband's family, they weren't members, and she sees the spirit of her husband's aunt come over, right? So we can now infer that Lori had gone to the temple, and she sees a personage. She she sees a spirit. It's another, I mean, this, and for, I mean, this is kind of like her saying she's seen yet another angel, okay? Yes. And this angel kisses her on the cheek and then disappears to the wall. So what we, what Lori essentially kind of flexing here. She did her family history work. She goes to the temple all the time. She sees angels and her angels even accept the work that Lori's done for them. Even so much as to kiss them on the cheek. And then they talk apparently. So this is like, again, it's one of those things where she is flexing here, right? If, if it's true, it's still a flex because she's talking about it. If it's not true, it's that's its own thing to unpack. But everything she's saying, <laughs> yet again, it's not outside of doctrine at all. You you hear things like this on a regular basis. We call it Mormon folklore, but it's one of those things. Like everyone has a story of a family member or a friend or someone that's seen someone after doing temple work. Everyone has a story like this. Is that trying? Is she trying to lend credibility when she says it? Hundred percent. Oh yeah. So so in the temple, when people have these visions, it's because they say, "Oh, the veil's so thin; they can like you can almost see into the next world because of it." No, is that a common phrase used? The veil, like, is the veil yes. a very common word yep. utilized in LDS? Oh church? yeah, all the time. Especially when they're like, "The veil was very thin." It's again like this little like. It's so dorky saying this out loud, Robin. (laughs) It's okay. Take all the time you need. Saying the veil is so thin is this like really like slang way of saying basically I could see the angel's tits from here. Like it's like it's like you could see (laughs) everything because of how holy you are and how holy the area was and how this and that and all these things that added up to it. You could see everything. It's it's a really weird way of saying that you are living your best spiritual life. You are in a place that very few people are even able to go. And then this super spiritual thing happened to you specifically and not those other, not that righteous people comparatively to you in that same vicinity. But how, I guess my one question is, how can the veil be thin for some but not for others? Well, that's because this is one of those situations where the church doubles down on it is a metaphor in this situation because um, it's a it's a figure of speech that there's this veil in our mind, which is why we can't remember what it was like being with God before we got our bodies. And so them saying that this veil is really thin is it makes it so you can now see like all these spirits and stuff. Just okay. <laughs> I know. So one other thing I just want to bring up is 
again, Lori's experience with this isn't that different from what you would hear in church from anyone else. In fact, there's this story I want to bring up from President Boyd K. Packer, who unfortunately passed away in 2015. Um, but at the time, he was the highest ranking apostle, meaning he would have been the next in line to be prophet of the church. So, you know, when he shares this story, in a way, we could hear that as scripture, as gospel. Right. So he he wrote this in uh, his book. And what he said was at the rededication of the Logan Temple in 1979, I recounted an incident in the life of my wife's grandfather, which I include here. One night, some years after the completion of the temple, Brother Smith was reading his newspaper. He heard a noise at the window and he saw his Indian friend peering in with an unusually sad expression. He went to the door and he found no one there and the snow beneath the window had not been disturbed. This incident bothered him greatly. And during the following week, he tried to locate and get some information about this Indian friend. He learned that he had died. In due time, he recorded, Today, I have taken care of his work in the temple. That very evening, he was looking through the mail again and heard a small or a sound at the window. When he looked up, he saw his Indian friend, this time smiling. So I know. Okay, first of all, it was a different time. And so what he's trying to say is Native American. But um, this is someone that was high ranking in the church. And this is his Mormon folklore story. This is his temple story. This happens to the highest ranking people. We hear these and it hits us like it, it it means something because we're in that same exact place that that thing happened for that person. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, it just adds some significance to where you are when you're in the temple. This is where those things happen. So for Lori to explain this spiritual sister, I mean, like this isn't this isn't really out of left field at all. Like this is entirely normal for her to be sharing. No, and it makes sense. And I've, I've done quite a bit of reading too, just because we do the cult series as well, as far as how different locations or, you know, the energy when you're around a group of people, especially like-minded people, how it can kind of manifest things like this. But I can completely, I can completely understand this. Yeah, I think that's important to note because like, again, like, I'm not trying to sound like we're being fair to Lori because I sincerely hope justice is served. I really do. I think she manipulates perfectly. But what she's saying in this moment, in the context of what had happened that we knew of then, what she shared was entirely above board in the Mormon church. This is entirely safe. It's not crazy. This isn't culty. Like nothing that she said or did in this situation is different from what the next in line to be prophet of the church said. So it, it, it's very comfortable for her to say that. Absolutely. People understand and accept it at face value for that matter. Absolutely. And everyone, and everyone has a story like this. You ask any Mormon, like what's, you wouldn't be able to, but like, you know, if you were a Mormon and you were talking to a Mormon friend and you were in the temple and you guys knew, anyways, if it was a right, If it was the right setting, you could ask someone like, well, what's something that was really significant in the temple that you feel comfortable sharing with me? A story like this would 100 percent be something you would hear. I mean, okay, one thing I will say is in Mormon culture, you're going to get mostly passive aggressive responses on things. So like even if she had like been saying something absolutely blasphemous, right, or if she had borne her testimony at a church and said some of these things, in my life, and I have been to, I, I don't even know how many fast and testimony meetings. I've heard some crazy stuff that people have said, like some really, most Mormons have. You've heard some crazy things over the pulpit, right? The bishop doesn't really get up and like tell them to sit down. That's <laughs> weird. And so we we normally like, even if we heard something weird or something that we're like, that's probably not true. Like we kind of And just slow clap back. at the end. Like we really... <laughs> No, we just say amen with maybe like less enthusiasm. (laughs) But I mean, like, it's just something to be said, like, maybe there was someone at that recording in that moment that was like, this is not Mm -hmm. normal. That didn't happen. 
there's no way that happened. And they still probably wouldn't have said anything because culturally, like, we don't really do that. I don't know why. I don't know. There's not a rule. I think that's an important distinction to make. If you looked at the other side of that and say you went to a very small Baptist church in the middle of Alabama and you were saying abortions for all, gay marriage for everyone, their reaction would be (laughs) vastly different. Yeah, we're a very like peaceable people, I would say. Like we're, you're not going to hear for the most part, like arguments happen at a church. Like you're, it's just not going to happen and you're not going to get called out. If you say something wrong, for example, like if I got up and I misquoted something, no one's going to get up and correct me. Oh, wow. Really? Like it would have to, oh no, no. It, it would be, it would have to be really significant for someone to get up. Uh, this is totally like, I don't have the source for this right now, but like just coming to mind right now, there was this little girl that got up in a testimony meeting and she bore this testimony about how she knew that even though she was, she's either gay or she's transgender. I can't remember. And I'm super sorry, but she got up and she bore her testimony, uh, testimony about how she knew that God still loved her, that God still saw her as a child of God and that she's not sinning by just admitting who she is and and she felt comfortable doing so in front of the congregation which is i mean i can't even imagine what that must have felt like as her as her as her parents watching that happen as her friends and family and this community that she's grown up in can't even imagine but it took that bishop i mean and i'd say like a full minute to get up and interrupt her and tell her like you can't say that wow. here, dude. Yeah. And and that's a pretty jarring thing. Like that is so beyond outside of Mormon accepted teaching. Like you you can't get up and say that. And she was able to say that for a full minute. So for Lori to say something that the next in line for the prophet said, no one would ever turn like this is totally this is totally fine. I just can't even imagine. I just I, I, I can't even imagine what it felt like being in that room. Um, let's get to the next piece, which It seems to me, I mean, we can assume it's referring to Alex. So I'm going to play this clip really, really quick. They said, they said to me, we're bringing our brother like you are bringing your brother. And I thought, how do they know that my excommunicated brother, who I love, who is now awake and knows everything I know, how do they know that? Because they know everything that is going on in our lives. Okay, first of all, in this, we learned, did we know previously that Alex had been excommunicated? Okay, so I remember reading something that he had, like, lost his way. It was, I'll have to go back and look, but it was something that, like, I think it might even been something that he admitted that he wasn't, I don't know. I don't know. I remember thinking that he had lost his way from the church, or maybe that's, like, the time that Lori was accused of like yelling at him in the street or something. I don't know, but maybe this was a different brother. Maybe it was Alex, but either way, what she's saying here is, is significant. So yet another personage appears to her uh, or two people. And they say, we're bringing our brother, like you are bringing yours. And um, the part that she refers to is the brother who I love who is now awake. Um, so we know that one of Lori's brothers is like, he's peace yeah. out of the situation, right? Like he's like, he has nothing <laughs> to do with his family. Um, and so like, I feel like we can deduct that this is Alex because we know that now. Um, so which, what Lori's trying to say, right, is she's trying to say that these people in this uh, spiritual holding cell um, they are aware of what we're doing. They know when we're doing their temple work for them, like which means getting married on their behalf, doing their baptisms on their behalf. Um, they're grateful for the work that we're doing for them and on their behalf as well. They know what's happening in our personal lives. So like they're like watching us and like seeing us and stuff. Um, and if this is Alex that we're assuming like we I feel like we can safely assume it's Alex right it's Alex okay so you know he's been excommunicated and now he's awake and he knows everything that Lori knows which means we can deduct that he too 
is identified as a special witness or warrior for Jesus Christ, and that he also has a mission to do. And so this is significant, too, because what Lori has kind of set her argument up as is she's elect. She is the highest calling from Jesus himself. She has this incredible mission to complete. She has fought for him. She knows everything she needs to do to fulfill the mission of God on this earth. And now she has her sidekick brother to help her with the process. And he is just as justified as she is in uh, defending Jesus, fighting for him, maybe maybe killing for him so long as it's justified according to the scriptures. It's really interesting. And I wonder, too, how this coincided with, um, like, Chad and his stuff and his doctrine, you know? Like, it's just, like, always kind of... I'm wondering mm-hmm. just how how much of the Kool Aid they had been drinking from Chad, and if this coincided with Chad. Yeah, I mean, because again, technically, what she's saying here, not that far outside of what we what we know. We do know that the that you know the veil is thin. That we we know that people who pass away, they're still with us. We're we're taught that all the time. It's actually one of the main things I think that brings. Um, Mormons peace when their loved ones pass away is we know that they're just right there that we do we can't see them but their spirits there they're close with us we feel them and so for her to testify to that and then to also help help illustrate how you know we are keenly aware of what they need from us and they're super aware of what we are worried about what we're focusing on that this is a hundred percent something that again solidifies that this is Lori was pretty mainstream. This isn't, this is not a weird doctrine for her to believe. This is totally something you would hear on a Sunday. You would hear this uh, maybe from um, an apostle or the prophet during general conference. It wouldn't be that weird to see something like this. It would be probably pretty spiritual and you'd probably feel something because you would think of your own loved ones and go, gosh, I, I hope I feel that too. I hope that happens to me one day. Everything that we've covered thus far up until this point, almost everything save for the piece where she was you know, pretty much like women can't be apostles. Everything has been ultimately mm-hmm. very mainstream, right? There's nothing that like where she skidded off the tracks into fringe. And yes. And I looked for the opposite. Like I, I looked and studied and tried finding, I was hoping for sure that this whole like quote back there that was really jarring. It was like, offend me once, offend me twice, offend me three times. I was like, there's no way that's in the scriptures. There's no way God would ever. And there it is. I mean, I'm shocked that most of this craziest, the craziest stuff that she's saying, it's scripture. It's in there. And it's not like, oh, she interpreted it, you know, differently or something. Like, no, like, historically speaking, those things were said specifically to kill someone that stood in the way of the greater good happening. No, that's fascinating. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. It's there. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let's continue on to the next piece, which is something that, especially when Chad's doctrine came out, the magical document that Ian Pulowski supposedly found on the computer as he was letting his ex-wife take it. The 144,000. Let me go ahead and play this next clip of audio and then we will break that down. The time is now. The Lord is gathering his people. He is calling people to the 144,000. They're already being called. They're already being sent on their mission. They're already going full circle. The time is now. He is coming. He is preparing us. And we promised we would do it. Okay. So 144,000, this is a number that's found in multiple religions. I mean, even when we covered Heaven's Gate, they were talking about the Heaven's Gate cult. UFO cult was talking about the 144,000. Oh, that's right. Let's break this down. Obviously, she's talking about the second coming. Uh Uh-huh. Unpack that more for us. Okay. So I am going to admit my ignorance here. Every time I've ever heard the 144,000, I've always instantly been like, okay, that's not a Mormon teaching. That's entirely something that Jehovah's Witnesses believe. And like other religions, I have to tell you, I was shocked to see that this is a Mormon scripture. Okay. Um, 
This is entirely something that is referred to. Um, so she, what Lori's first saying, right? So what she's alluding to here is that it's, it's called the gathering of Israel. So in the Mormon church, we believe that everyone is descended. Everyone in the church is essentially descended and part of a certain tribe, spiritually speaking, but kind of maybe a little bit literal, but we can get into that another time. Um, and so gathering Israel means bringing everyone into this, into the church, doing their work for them in the temple, bringing them together. And so Mormons believe that it's, it's our job to teach the gospel to everyone so that Jesus can come again. So I think the argument to what she's saying here, if I, if I can first defend the church a little bit, in the gospel and then we'll unpack a little bit. So my gut reaction looking at this is like, technically speaking, no one is aware of when the second coming is going to be. There's like multiple scriptures that say like, no man knoweth. Right. And like, um, so she can't speak to that. She can't be like, it's tomorrow. Like she has no authority to say so. In fact, no one has authority to say so. Um, and again, I always thought the 144,000 was a Jehovah's Witness thing, not a Mormon. And so hearing this, my gut reaction was like, okay, here's the start of the baloney. But I was wrong. So here's actually what Joseph Smith said. This is in 1835. Um, Obviously, Joseph Smith was the founding prophet of the restored church. And what Joseph Smith said was, quote, it is the will of God that those who went to Zion with a determination to lay down their lives if necessary should be ordained to the ministry to go forth and prove the vineyard for the last time or the coming of the Lord, which is nigh even 56 years should wind up the scene. Okay. Let me just unpack that. So he said that in 1835, February of 1835 would be specific and 56 years, which is he's referring to even 56 years should wind up the scene. So that's saying that, he predicted the second coming to be February of 1891. So that would have been right after Joseph Smith's 85th birthday, but that didn't happen. And Joseph Smith didn't live to see that. So, you know, okay. I don't know how to unpack that piece of it. A hundred percent. It just didn't Um, happen, girl. It just didn't happen. (laughs) It just didn't happen. Like, okay. So now let's look at like more modern, right? Like, let's be fair to Joseph. Maybe there were some things that got in the way. Maybe there was some wickedness or whatever. And for whatever reason, God decided the second coming was not happening 56 years to wind up the scene. So today's prophet, Russell M. Nelson, we know that he's alive, that he is still speaking on behalf of God himself. And just last year, 2019, he gave his talk in general conference where he said, and this is a quote too, so starting right now, quote, now as president of his church, I plead with you to those who have distanced yourselves from the church and with those of you who have not yet really sought to know that the Savior's church has been restored. Do the spiritual work to find out for yourselves and please do it now. Time is running out, end quote. So, We've been hearing that the second coming is right around the corner for a very long time. Most members of the church have had patriarchal blessings, which we can get into another time. But it's basically like, this is a very disrespectful way to explain it, but it's like Mormon fortune telling. We have special blessings that are given to us to tell us what our futures have in store for us if we're righteous. People have had these patriarchal blessings from back in Joseph Smith's time where it's it's told to them that they would see the second coming. And it hasn't happened, right? Like, it just hasn't. And so for Lori to reiterate what she's read and heard through her entire life, that all of us have heard our entire Mormon life, technically, this isn't that weird either. We've all heard this and we've all kind of been like, oh, it didn't happen. And maybe maybe my kids will be the ones that see it. You know, maybe this will be. I don't know why we shrug that off that like so many prophets have said that it's going to happen and it doesn't. Like, I don't know 100 percent why, but we, we kind of do just move on and we just like keep preparing now, for it. Really quick side note, I don't too, not to interrupt you, but what I find so interesting and just a side note for other people who are not LDS is this is also the concept of where like preparation comes from, right? Like why you must prepare. Oh, yeah. A lot of members of the LDS, you know, have months and months, if not years of a food supply, water, different things like that. Yeah. 
why do you think, and not to interrupt you, and I'm so sorry if this does like alter your train of thought, but no, like, you're by good. all accounts, Lori and Alex, none of them actually prepared. So for, I find it really interesting that for someone who whose entire doctrine is based on the second coming, we have to complete our mission. They didn't prepare for it at all. I think in a literal sense, that would probably be fair, right? Mm-hmm. Like they moved so much and like we know they didn't have a lot of belongings, right? Like the police reports say that there was like a mattress on the floor and like they didn't really have furniture. Um, I would say in a literal sense that maybe they weren't the best preppers. And sometimes even the most devout Mormons aren't the best preppers. They maybe only have a two week food supply or a one month food supply. Um, it's definitely not something that you have to be a prepper to be a Mormon. It just so happens that I think you're more likely to prep. But your if righteousness you are. is not based on I how think, far you've prepped. Okay. No. Mm-mm, no. And, and I mean, like, there's Mormons all over the world where it's like just not feasible. Like, if you live in a New York City studio apartment, how the hell are you going to store a year <laughs> supply of food? You know, it's just not going to happen. And so. I think that's why the church does a pretty good job of explaining that more importantly than physically preparing for the second coming, it's that spiritual preparation. And Lori hammers us hard in what she's saying, right? Like her big thing is as a special witness of Jesus Christ, her main mission is to spiritually bring people to Jesus, not make it possible for them to physically live long enough to see him. I think to me, I think that's kind of like talk about our friend, Julie Rowe, I think that's what her big thing is. Like she really hammers in like the whole like physical preparation, you know, buy, buy these survival kits, buy this. Like, I mean, she really, I mean, how many people have admitted that they've drained their 401k because of her to go buy physical prep? A handful. Gear? I would say, uh, yeah. I mean, I would say that technically I would align myself if I had to pick Pick my adventure. <laughs> Choose my own adventure here. I would probably go the Lori Vallow route in terms of how she interprets that doctrine to spiritually prepare versus the physical, because I think that's kind of more in line with doctrine to spiritually prepare for that second coming of Jesus Christ. That makes total sense, actually. Thank you. No problem. Okay, so the next part is the 144,000, mm-hmm. right? Like, this part's, again, I was shocked, but guys, this is in Doctrine and Covenant, DNC, right? 133, verse 18. So it says, When the Lamb shall stand upon Mount Zion, and with him an hundred and forty four thousand, having his father's name written on their foreheads. When I read this, I had to like read it like three times <laughs> to be like, there's no way this number is in like this exact, the exact number. So, to make that even worse, I was like, there's no way it's the same thing. No, it is, guys. Because in the footnotes of that same scripture, there's like this reference that then takes you to DNC 77, where in that Joseph Smith does a little Q&A with God. And, and it, it's written down. So it's like this back and forth of like, what are we to make of this? And God answers. And then Joseph goes, OK, well, what about this? So again, Joseph Smith is the prophet. It's written down in DNC and the source we're quoting is God himself. So like, I don't know how more direct we can get with that 144,000. I hate that I'm wrong here, but here's what it says. And so again, Joseph asks, what are we to make of this 144,000 number? God says, we are to understand that those who are sealed as high priests ordained unto the holy order of God to administer the everlasting gospel for they are they who are ordained out of the every nation, kindred, tongue, and people by the angels to whom it is given power over the nations of the earth to bring as many as will come under the church of the firstborn. So then to see the church of the firstborn, I'm like, are you kidding me? And it's all in there. That's the, that, this, this is the really hard part. Again, as someone who it's like, I was raised studying the gospel. I mean, I didn't just read this occasionally. Like I was, was shocked that even after all my studies of doctrine and covenants of knowing the gospel, I had, I had just breezed right over this scripture. How many times it's right here. All of these references to Julie and the, and the church of the firstborn, the 144,000 back in December, when I first read about this case and I started listening to this podcast, 
I couldn't have been more like, like disgusted with the idea of Lori and Chad and Julie latching onto Mormonism and just making stuff up. But like, here it is, you know, like it's in the scripture. It's right there. It says the number. It says the church of the firstborn. And here it is. It's saying ordained the holy order of God, administer the everlasting gospel. Guys, like that's the special witness thing that Lori's mm-hmm. saying she's she's a special witness now. And so it's like, is she is she crazy? Probably. But is she quoting actual scripture and, and applying it correctly based on what's also, yes. like? Yes. Also that, too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's crazy. Um, real quick to second coming gathering of Israel. So just to kind of explain that scripture just a little bit more. Um, it's interesting to hear that, like when they talk about gatherers, right? So Lori, I think in a different audio clip said that she was a gatherer and she like notices Mm -hmm. other gatherers. I think it plays into the scripture as well as gathering of Israel. She is one of these people one of the 144,000 that is gathering the rest of Israel. So again, cementing her place as like a, a VIP, basically. Yeah, right. And she's already established that too, because she sat down with Jesus before this world even began, knowing that this was who she was and who she needed to be. And nothing could stand in her way. And speaking of that, let's go into that piece. So let me play the next one, because this is where she, I i mean, at least from an outsider's perspective, where she doubles down on how much street cred she has and how important and how chosen she is. Sure. I told the Lord, why would you do this to me? Why? You made me this super sweet person. I'm so sensitive. My whole life, everything hurt my feelings. I was totally sweet and innocent and I was like why would you ask me to fight this life and be this warrior why did you send me here you know my personality you know I hate to fight I will avoid a fight at all costs and he gave me a pretty mortal memory of me and I got to see myself as a warrior fighting for the savior in the pre-mortal world, if I went to other worlds and I fought and I was one of his strongest warriors and I saw it and he showed me so that I could never deny it again. I was not sweet and I was not innocent. I am old. I have fought. I have fought in many, I have fought in this war for millennia and that's who I am. And I came down here to be a warrior to fight. And I only fought. Unpack that for us, please. Okay, so this one was a lot. And it definitely starts, she starts sprinkling in the doctrine that we're starting to see a little bit more of that Chad Daybell and the Julie Rowe doctrine weaving into this. Okay, so I want to try and drive a little bit of like a distance there, but not so much of one because we do have scriptures referencing to it. So I want to be fair to all parties. Um, Jesus giving her a pre-mortal memory of her. That's actually not exclusive to Lori. In the Book of Mormon, there are instances of um, Jesus talking to a prophet and showing them visions of the past, showing them visions of the future, um, and walking with them in this vision and trying to help paint this picture for them as a way to prove that there is no denying this. Like, surely this this wouldn't be real if I if I didn't see all these details. So it really just kind of helps cement a testimony of like you can't doubt this because how could you possibly make this up about the past and the future and the present? So so there is precedent, scriptural precedent to this happening. So I don't want to like say this isn't you know. It, that this is entirely crazy because it's happened it, according to scripture. So to see her as a warrior fighting for the savior in the pre-mortal world, we do know that there was this life before the one that we're in right now and that we were all spirits and that there was a, a, a war in heaven is what we call it. And you had to pick a side. You had to pick Jesus or Satan essentially. Um, so to, for her to call herself a warrior fighting for Jesus, we know what side she was on. And we can assume that she takes that very seriously. She considers herself to be 
very elect to be a literal warrior um, to be it's it's massive flexing on her part. Next claim. So far, we're, we're still above, you know, the bullshit meter. OK, so the next part, I went to other worlds. This is kind of a gray area. So there there are scriptures that talk about how God has made a number of worlds. In fact, the scripture is something along the lines of like worlds without number. Um, so, yes. OK, like okay, I can I can see it. Um that's in the book of Moses that was translated directly by Joseph Smith. I'll give her that one too. Um, so yes, maybe she went to other worlds in this vision. Um, next thing I fought, I was one of his strongest warriors and I saw it. He showed me so I could never deny it again. So this is her alluding to the part where she has seen so much that if she were to deny it, it's the most extreme apostasy. If she denies it, it makes her the same as Satan. That escalated like, quickly. Hell forever. Yeah. So, but there's this kind of undertone to say to deny it that one of the worst sins you could commit as a Mormon is to deny the Holy Ghost. Well, the Holy Ghost made this whole vision possible. Jesus showed her this so she could never deny it again. So the stakes are very, very high for her. The intensity of if Lori believes everything she's saying, she holds herself to the same esteem as a prophet that has seen tons of visions, tons of things that for her to go against it, it would, would have been the same as when Satan, who knew everything that needed to be, also fell. So, yeah, it, it definitely sets in where it's like, dude, what are some again, what's this ex-husband? He's a blip on the radar of the success of eternity. Um, the next part, I was not sweet. I was not innocent. I am old. I have fought. I have fought in this war for millennia. That's who I am. And I came down here to be a warrior. That's hardcore. <laughs> Technically, this is where we do start to get into the whole like past lives, reincarnation, multiple multiple she's trying to like pass herself off as you know warrior princess it sounds yeah 100 percent. yeah so i mean this is where like i i have to like make it really clear the the church makes it very clear that we do not believe in reincarnation we do not believe in past lives there was the pre-existence where we didn't have bodies we just were spirits there's this life there's a spiritual holding tank and then there's the, you know, different levels of heaven and, and so, or hell. Um, so for this part, I really had to do some digging to be like, okay, what's this whole, like, I am old. I have fought mm-hmm. multiple times. Like she's <laughs> totally alluding to multiple mold, mortal probations. Like she's dancing around it. She didn't use the words multiple mortal probations, but, but it's there to be entirely fair. Okay. So it'd be super upfront. The only way that I could pull a lot of these references, I did have to go towards what are called the Journal of Discourses. It's super interesting. They're recordings from early teachings of the church by prophets, by apostles. There's a big disclaimer on that, though. Even though it's on the church's website for gospel resources, it's written that it it, it by itself is not an authoritative source of church doctrine. Oh, wow. But... That's why I'm not going to be using it as my sole source here today. So I'm going to be using scripture to go along with it. Um, The testimony that's in there, though, and the quotes, it's super helpful if you're trying to understand where did Chad and Julie pull this from? It's here. This is where it comes from. Um, But there's scriptures that back it up, which is why I think there's so many believers and such a significant following of Julie. I mean, that's not insignificant. For them to have, it's not insignificant for a vow or um, preparing a people to have the following they do. It, it, you can't just have one person say this. It has to be lots of different scriptures backing this up. So Heber C. Kimball, he was a prophet. Just, I mean, in terms of Mormon standards, not that long ago. And in a general conference talk, this is where um, he quoted what Joseph Smith taught as a prophet. So this is his quote. He said, Joseph always told us that we would have to pass by sentinels that are placed between us and our father and God. 
Then, of course, we are conducted along from this probation to other probations or from one dispensation to another by those who conducted those dispensations, end quote. All right. So that was not from the Journal of Discourses. That's something that Heber C. Kimball taught at the pulpit, televised, like this is what we could consider gospel because a prophet said it from the pulpit. It, I don't know how else to take that because I'm looking at this as multiple mortal operations. A sentinel is a guarding angel, not a, not necessarily like a guardian angel, but like it's a warrior angel is what a sentinel is. Um, it plays into Lori being a warrior. Um, a probation is considered a lifetime. So one lifetime. So you're being conducted from this lifetime to another. A dispensation is is a period of time in which a probation is lived. I, I don't know another way to explain that. It's totally a multiple mortal probation type quote that I, unless I can have a Mormon scholar break this down, I can 100% see how Julie and Chad got there. I can totally see, see that's it. That's something that's been really interesting. Um, so in the past, when we when we did an episode on this, you know, we did receive quite a bit of feedback from members of the LDS Church. They were very explicitly clear that multiple probations, it's not a thing. And that's not even the end of it is the hard part. And here's the thing. Like, as a Mormon, I can tell you, I've never been taught uh, reincarnation. I've never been taught multiple mortal probations. I've been through the temple. I was married in the temple. Like, I have been through like all the levels and here I, this is a lot of stuff that I'm researching through the eyes of Lori and Chad and Julie. It ironically is eyes wide open or whatever Julie likes to say at the start of her stuff. <laughs> like it's, it's baffling to me that I never read it in the way that they did. Um, but it is there. Um, Second Nephi, so this is in the Book of Mormon, just to kind of allude to like, well, maybe probation is different. It says here in verse 21, and the days of the children of men were prolonged according to the will of God that they might repent while in the flesh, wherefore their state had become a state of probation. Their time was lengthened according to the commandments which the Lord God gave to the children of men. Um, so their time on earth and their probation with their physical body was lengthened so that they had time to repent. I, again, I can see that. Um, now a Joseph Smith quote. So again, this is another source we can quote from. We trust everything he has said, right? So the power of the Melchizedek priesthood is to have the power of endless lives for the everlasting covenant cannot be broken. That was a little jarring to read. And I thought, okay, well, again, all these things we're reading, not all of this just came from the journal discourses. We have the book of Moses. We have the book of Mormon. We have all these different things. We have prophets. And now we have a modern thing here. This is on BYUI's website. This is a quote um, featuring something that Lorenzo Snow, another prophet of the church shared. This is also in uh, the journal of discourses, though. So this is the part where, that has the warning. Don't take this by itself. But we also now have laid kind of some other examples where it backs this up. This is what Lorenzo Snow said. We are immortal beings. That which dwells in this body of ours is immortal and will always exist. Our, individual, our individuality will always continue. Eternities may begin. Eternities may end. And we shall still have our individuality. Our identity is ensured. We will be ourselves and nobody else. Whatever changes may arise, whatever worlds may be made or pass away, our identity will always remain the same. And we will continue on improving, advancing, and increasing in wisdom, intelligence, power, and dominion, worlds without end. End quote. Um, that was in April 1901. I was said in conference from a pulpit. I mean, that, that, that's pretty explicitly clear from an outsider's perspective. Yeah. And so, again, imagine, like, being a Mormon for a second and, like, being like, there's no freaking way. And then as I'm reading this, it's like, oh, my gosh, like, there's, there's totally scripture to back up, Julie. 
Julie Rose maybe isn't crazy. Like, what is happening in 2020 for me to start, like, understanding Julie Rowe better? And, like, maybe Chad Daybell makes a good point. Like, what? But, like, it's there. You have prophets explaining this. You have scriptures backing it up. I'm not saying that this is something that Mormons do believe. I'm saying that I can see why there's some a scriptural feel that basis way. for it in some capacity. Yeah. Multiple. Yeah. Like everything I'm pulling here. I mean, for for the church to have the little asterisk of like, hey, like don't just listen to this if I mean it's by itself is not okay. Like you probably need a little bit more. But here's a lot more to back it up. Like it's there. I hope that you guys are having as much fun with Brittany as we did. She's very, very, very knowledgeable. And it makes so much sense. A lot of the stuff that Lori Vallow said, it makes a lot of sense now. And knowing that there are relevant scriptures out there that she was citing for her own purposes, it makes it all the more chilling in some regards. So we have had a blast having her on and we will continue part three with this later this week. So again, you can find us at wesawthedevil.com. We saw the devil on Facebook and Twitter. We saw the devil podcast on Instagram. And if you love us and want to back us, Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash we saw the devil. Again, thank you for listening. Until next crime.